Hey, welcome to Bifocal. Uh, today's show, uh, we have a business owner on, an actual uh, owner of two different businesses, uh, web design, web development, and an IT business. And we're going to talk about both of those industries, what's going on in those industries, and specifically how COVID may have impacted both of those industries. So stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. Today's show, we have Joshua Holmes. He is the owner of a company called Etho, web design, web development company. Also owner and partner of a company called Lightspeed, uh, cloud services, IT services, hosting services. And uh, he's agreed to come on the show and kind of talk about both of those businesses, both of those industries, and what is going on in those industries, uh, especially in light of COVID. So Joshua, welcome to the show. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, it's nice being so close to you guys down here. <laughs> you, are, you are close, you are down the road. Yeah. Well, and this is, this is one of the reasons why we love the, this community and this city and we built here. Uh, we, we didn't wanna be in a big city. We wanted the, the relationship factor of, as we grew to be a big part of how we interacted with our clients. It's, um, it's an organization that we might have a lot of IT and engineer personalities, but they're heavily uh, they're heavily centered around communication and humans and interaction. And they're the anti you know the anti nerd, right? You know, we all yeah. know those kids we went to school with who <clears throat> were so smart they could barely have conversations with people. But there's the, another section of people who are smart and they actually love people as well, you yeah. know. And so we like this community, and we we felt like ten years ago it was the place to be. Yeah. You know? Well, it's it's interesting because you're you're involved in two different industries. Generally, those industries um, they they don't often intersect with the same type of personalities, right? The yep. The, yep. the the web design side, a little more creative, a little bit more personality, yep. right? The the IT side, just a different like as you meant, it's just a different breed of person. But you're involved in both. So how to maybe just give me a high level. How did both of those come across? <laughs> well, uh, I'll be honest from a design perspective. That's not my strong suit. Um, I, I am an identical twin. I don't know if you knew that. I have an identical twin. Who didn't know that. Uh, and he's in Akron, by the way. So if you ever see me and you wave and and uh, like someone acts like they don't know you, it's probably him. It's not okay. even me. All right. So don't uh, get mad. And I joke about that, but that's happened. I've, I've had people be like, hey, man, you blew me off. I'm like, it wasn't me. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, but my, my twin got all the artistic skills. I mean, phenomenal painter, drawer, uh, charcoal, you name it. He, you know, he was, he was pretty amazing. Uh, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. It's just, I, I didn't get that function. Now I'm great with math and sciences. I was phenomenal at music, uh, but visual talent wasn't necessarily. So did you guys get along growing up? Uh, we didn't get along till college, until we got away from each other. And then you can appreciate each other. And, yeah. and then I felt like, you know, we've been best friends since then. You know, we get we get together uh, right now. Once a week, we do golf league. So his company has a golf league. He's a part of it. He wrangled me into a couple of years ago that I do. Um, but we do see each other often. And and I come from a, from a big family. There's eight of us. He's the only one I really see like a couple, you know, a couple of weeks out of every month. I see him at least. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so, so you, which company started first, Ethode or Lightspeed? So, so Ethode did. And my background was, you know, I started, we call web design. Everyone called it web design 20 years ago. And, and there was a lot of design around it. It was more of a visual art than anything else. And when you're not artistic, you tend to uh, buy from people who artistically create those uh, templates and then you implement them. So I was never heavily involved with the artistic side of it and I would have to rely on people who were. But at the same time, if you had anything that was more sophisticated than a brochure website, there just wasn't a lot of people who could do it. There just was, especially in the country. I grew up in Norwalk, Ohio. No one knew how to do any of this. You know, you were lucky if you had dial-up internet. Yeah. But you, you made a good point. You know, I think the, the, the website industry, it was pretty static there for a while, pretty static yep. pages. Right. And then all of a sudden, I don't know where and when, but 
people started figuring out they could do a little bit more. And then, you know, had some of the animation stuff started coming into it and other things like that and movement. And then it was like sky's the limit. And then I think people got overboard with it. <laughs> right. And now it seems like it's kind of going back a little bit, a little bit more, get to where I need to get to quickly, get my message quick. So I'm, I, you, you've probably seen some changes go on in the industry. Yeah, and, and not all good changes. We all remember those flash intros that wasted 15 seconds of your life and showed you and something. the developer that, was more interested yeah. in doing it oh, yeah. to show what they did than the, than, the, than the viewer watching it. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, we always talk about the 80-20 rule. I think 80% of people were like, yeah, just get me out of the site. And then there's a 20% of people who thought it was the coolest thing ever. Oh, uh, me not being a graphics guy, I always thought, you're just flash. wasting my time, you know, come that on. Was that, that was it. That was it. Yeah. But, but I remember that phase uh, we were always more focused on um, like e-commerce type businesses businesses where once you're done with the design that's just 10% of the project there's so much more happening after that that you have to consider whether it be shipping or inventory or management or ordering there's a lot of rules that go into the e-commerce world and there's a lot of people who have their whole businesses that run online now but 10, 15, 20 years ago, the only businesses where your whole business depended on the internet were a few e-commerce companies. Yeah. And you probably remember this, but there was the build it and they will come moment with the internet. And there really was. There was a time when you could build a website and within a couple of weeks, you could have 10,000 people on that website in a day. It just wasn't saturated with people all doing the same thing. And I was fortunate to, to grow up with a father who encouraged me to I, you know, I wasn't in, in college yet. I was in high school. So rather than flipping burgers, I ran my own business. And, and he would tell everybody. I mean, anyone he ran into, he'd find a way to slip in like, oh, by the way, my son can. <laughs> and so I, I, was, I was just very fortunate that I wasn't brought up in a way where the idea of starting a business was fearful. Uh, my father worked for Ford for 32 years. And back when it was good money, you know, full benefits, he had eight kids, you know, it would have been a huge risk to quit that job, lose your pension and benefits with My eight kids. My dad worked at the Hoover Company for 42 years. Then you you understand it's it was a way of life and yep. a very few people really quit. Um, and it was a different time. It was a different time. But my father always wanted to start a business. So it wasn't until I was I was a tween. I was like 12 years old. He had been retired for, for about 10 years. Uh, and he went back to college to learn how to build PCs. And so he got me into it. And I thought, well, the hardware is fun. Don't get me wrong. Was this but maybe in the 80s, late 70s, 80s? So this was the, the early 90s. 90s. So like JavaScript wasn't even a thing yet. Like websites were pure HTML. Like they could do very little back then. Uh, I mean, you could read a, a two page book and you knew HTML. <laughs> it was just such a, yeah. it was a basic time. Uh, and the hardware was fun. I did a lot of that early on because uh, it was money. You know, I was I was junior high in high school and I wanted to be doing something to, to earn money. Uh, and so I would go along on all of his service calls. And when PCs would have to come and this was common, everyone would just, just take it back with you. If it doesn't take three hours, take it back with you. Yeah. So I was always at the house fixing PCs so that he could drop them off at the customer's. Um, and then I got into the web stuff and, and the web stuff was was really I wasn't looking for it. It found me. Uh, a buddy of mine who was also into computers is like, hey, you got to learn this HTML thing. Like the web's going to be the future. And I, I remember thinking, well, I kind of have the Internet. I don't spend much time on it other than buying computer parts. <laughs> and, but, but I'll check it out. And so um, I was at that time, I was in maybe the seventh grade and he handed me a book for HTML and he goes, just learn it. And so I did. Ironically, he has no life in IT. He like he for like maybe a year or two, he was interested. And then that was it for him. But he got me started in my interest in IT and programming. And, you know, once I learned HTML, I thought, well, what other languages are out there? What can you do with them? You know, and it just became vastly more interesting than hardware and fixing Windows problems. And some guy messed up his Windows 3.1 installation. It, it, it wasn't even fun anymore. The programming was so fun for me because it finally gave me something creative to do that wasn't visually creative. When you were going through that, were you thinking about what am I going to do with it? What's the <laughs> application? Or did you kind of know where you where you could take it? Um, so I, I was just talking about this with my kids, in fact. So my oldest is 10. 
And I said, you know, my dad really encouraged me to take my skills and find ways to make money with it. So, but I wish I knew then what I know now about where the industry was going to go as a whole. So, you know, seeing what is online now and seeing what has made billions of dollars for certain people, you know, some of the stuff I could have been a part of if it was something that was interesting to me. I was far more interested in, can I make three hundred dollars this week so that I could go hang out with my friends and buy this cool thing that I wanted? Yeah, you know, I wasn't thinking about building a customer base and a big portfolio and reoccurring passive income. Like I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff. I was so young; it was just fun for me. It was a it was an outlet. Uh, some people and I played sports. Some people play sports. Some people they hang out with friends and party. You know, they have that thing that they do to get away. Like for me, that was sitting in my basement on my computer coding. Like that was my fun thing. But I, I never really looked at it as a way to like, you know, in, at least until high school, I didn't look at it as a way that like this could be my whole career, my profession for the rest of my sure. life. It was just, it was fun now and it made me money now. And it was a short term vision. So did you go into college with the intent? This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> well, so I, I did decide there was a, a point in which I hadn't decided whether I wanted to go into like youth counseling or computer science. I enjoyed the computer stuff. I had been doing it for a long time. That's, that's like 180, right? It, it is. Well, now here's the thing. So I, I, you know, I came from, there's eight kids in my family and my mom ran a daycare from our house. So I spent most of my life around younger kids and some came from great families and, and some did not, you know, this is just the nature of any city, right? There's going to be people who come from every socioeconomic disparity uh, there. And I really enjoyed working with the kids, especially the ones that really needed help or they, they just, they were in an environment where there was no structure. And once you saw them get structure in their life and, and get steps, they actually flourished. So there was a part of me that really enjoyed that. <clears throat> um, and, and I felt like it was something I could do that was fulfilling as well as just a living. And my father really encouraged me. He said, you ought to just dual major because you don't know what you're going to do. And if you decide you don't like this route, you have a fallback. And you've already taken in college. I did two years of college while I was in high school. So I already had my associates before I went over to university. You were university. one of those advanced students, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, and I'll, I was in college still going back, finishing up high school. <laughs> I um. Uh, so I, I'm not a high IQ guy uh, and I'm super average in all my testing. I was a 21 in the ACTs. But when it came to things that were interesting to me, I could excel very well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's just part of my personality. Uh, in fact, my, my business partner is the same way. If he's not interested in something, it's very hard to comprehend it and bring it in and absorb it. If he's interested in it, he'll be a genius in a week in that subject. Today they call that ADD. Yes. Right? And we're both ADD. Uh, both I, were told as young kids we should be medicated. Both of us had parents yeah. who were like, I'm never medicating my kid. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all got ADD. DD, right? We just, we want to focus on yeah. what we like to focus on. I tell you, and, and not everyone's like that. I totally get that. I have one child who doesn't matter what the subject is. She's going to do amazing in it because she can just, she can bunker down and she can concentrate. And I'm just not that way. And I have one of my children who's just like me. And I told my wife, don't worry. Like she's going to have subjects. She's going to be lucky to get a C in. And that's fine. The things that she's really interested in, she'll excel at. And that's sure. where she's going to yeah. sp spend the rest of her life. If you go to school for chemistry, does it really matter that you weren't good at art? It, it, it doesn't. Just get through, get through the class, make sure you pass it, and focus on the things that you're going to spend the rest of your life interested yeah. in. So what did you get your degree in then? So I did wind up doing computer science with a, a it was um, a, a youth counseling minor, and I didn't finish my last year. So my, my father got cancer in 05. Didn't tell anyone until 06. And by that time, it was pretty advanced. And so I came back from college and I said, well, if you've got a year left, like I want to spend it with you. So uh, my dad had a duplex he bought right before he got cancer and had gutted it. So I spent a year, year and a half refinishing a duplex with my dad while he was kind of slowly deteriorating. But it was time that I would never, um, like I had no money. I was a college student. I had no money. I was in debt. Uh, I, you know, and I was doing like at night, I was trying to do some programming jobs just to keep some money flowing in and I would never do it differently. Like that time with him was super crucial, uh, for me developmentally outside of my career, just as a human being, it was, it was important. Well, it sounds like your dad was pretty influential on some of your thought process early on. Yeah, he, he was my, 
my dad grew up in Virginia, so he was born in 1940. Uh, he grew up in the mountains. I mean, like nobody lived there type mountains. You know, you could look with a microscope for, you know, and not see a neighbor. And so you were very self-sufficient. If your car broke, you learn how to fix it. If your mower broke, you learn how to fix it. You know, the idea of just taking something somewhere and have it fixed was not common the way he grew up. And so my father was was really good about, you know, teaching me how to work for what you want and how to learn to do something, even if, even if you're gonna pass it off to someone else. And, and this is a lesson I've had to learn in business. It's still nice to have a good knowledge of how that thing works. If you're going to hire for position, if you don't know what you're hiring for, how do you know that they're not fleecing you? And so, you know, I, I, I became a master of one or two things, but I'm a generalist on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And that, that, has, that was a huge lesson I learned from my father is you can't be a master at everything. You can't. You chase two rabbits, you're never going to catch one of them. Yeah. Um, but you need to get good at a cursory uh, knowledge of the things that you're going to be involved in and then find one thing that you're going to get like master level in. So when did you start Etho then? So in 2010, I was actually working for a company that did e-commerce. So there's um, in LaGrange, Ohio, in the cornfields is a $40 million e-commerce company. Most people don't know they exist. Um, I was there for about three years uh, and I love working there. They're great people. Um, and you did what? Uh, I, I ran all the software for all their all their five sites and inventory system. And then there was only one other person in IT. Uh, that was my boss at the time. And he mainly ran the servers and the infrastructure. So that's where you got your experience to e-commerce. Well, so I, I was before I worked for them, I had already done quite a few e-commerce gigs solo. So as a contractor and the company I worked at before Spacebound, I was only there for maybe a year. Uh, and I was running uh, the infrastructure for Cheesecake Factory. So I built their site from the ground up and then was running the infrastructure. Uh, and then I, I left there. I just couldn't like for me at that company and they're great people. I know it's a lot different now than I was there. When I was there, it was growing like a hockey stick and I was working 80 hours a week. You know, there was mandatory weekends on times like it was it was just really hard to find enjoyment in my career. Uh, doing the thing that I loved. And so when I left there, one of the things I looked for was culture and environment, something I hadn't even considered when I took that job. Um, and so I, I spent quite a bit talking back and forth with uh, Spacebound. Uh, that's their parent company. They have a couple sites underneath the parent company. And uh, it was just a really good fit from a culture standpoint. They were very servant leadership focused, very active in the community and philanthropy. Um, and I, I felt like from a management standpoint, they really had an environment that allowed you to be autonomous and set goals and then try to reach them as long as they aligned with the goals of the organization. And, and I loved being there for three years, um, but my personality, I, I really wanted to work for myself. And the way I described it was being in, a, being in a cube or office all day long, working for someone else almost feels claustrophobic. That's how I would describe it to someone who's not familiar. Some people love having their own office, working for somebody else, no pressure. For me, it feels like I'm in a cave and I got nowhere to move. And that sounds crazy to some people. So how old were you when you finally branched out and said, hey, I'm going to do this on my own? I was 25. So you're pretty young. Yeah, I was 25 and I had a list of clients that I was doing basically moonlight hours on. And a buddy of mine said, you know, I don't know if you like your job or not, but um, the company I'm working for is really growing. It's an upstart and we could really use a full time senior developer. I said, well, I'm not going to quit working here to go work for someone else full time. I said, I actually really like it. If I want to work anywhere full time for a long time, I'll just stay here. I love it here. Um, I said, but if he's interested in buying some of my hours, I can give him some hours. And I'm really, I've been talking about quitting my job here and starting a firm. And so I met with him and I, I could tell he really needed what I brought to the table. And most of it actually wasn't my coding skill, although that was something I brought to the table. What he really needed was a, a solution architect. He had a SaaS product that he had created around the medical industry. And the whole thing was architected in a way where you could never really grow it. It just was never going to succeed. And so long story short, I came on board and he bought half my hours for the whole year at a rate where what he was paying me made up my whole salary that I was losing by quitting. So all the other jobs I had on top of that were just gravy. They were just extra. So that was the catapult that you 
that you said, hey, I'm going to start my own then. That's right. You and got, um, got a customer. And, and, it, and it's funny. So, I mean, you can see I'm, I'm not a quiet or shy guy, which in IT is rare. That worked to my benefit. I know everybody. You know, everyone knew who I was and I came from a big family. So there was a big pool of people that once they found out what I was doing, they would either have work for me to do or they would introduce me to another business that they knew. And so I, I was fortunate that um, because I was from a big family and I knew a lot of people uh, and I spent a great deal of my time being social, you know, throughout my my years up leading to that. Uh, that there was a lot of people who who wanted to do business with me because they trusted me. How did you come up with the name Ethode? So <laughs> it was uh, nothing miraculous. I'm not a, I'm not a brand guy. It's not my strong suit. Just like graphics, there was a company called Brand Bucket. And they're still in existence, but what they would do is they would find people who had domain names that were interesting sounding, but they were just parked on GoDaddy. And they would approach them and they would they would make a fake logo and a fake business. And they would say, we think that you could sell this domain for $10,000 instead of $1,000 you have it listed for, but we're gonna make a fake business around it and kind of set the vision for someone who sees that domain. And it was genius. They made they made so much money again doing the thing that I'm not good at, right? Which is why I was on their site. You know, they are good at it. Let's use them. They had one that was ethoid. It was ethoid with an I, and I thought, well, no one's gonna know how to pronounce it. Is it a Y? Is it an I? Uh, what does it mean? It, there was too many things that was wrong about it. But I thought, if you just remove the I, it's not terrible. And so I, I went on GoDaddy, and sure enough, it wasn't. Like no one had ever registered anything. There was no usernames anywhere. Uh, back then, like MySpace, Twitter wasn't a thing. Like nowhere, no one had registered Ethode for anything. And so I just registered it. And that's that's how I got started. Well, you know, I, I drive by your, your office every day, multiple times a day. And before I came to know you, I didn't know what I didn't know what the business was, but I saw it every day because it's right beside Subway, mm -hmm. you know, and I would always look there and I've even gone in Subway. So I'd right by your building. I never knew what it was until I, you know, got introduced to you. I'll tell you, we've had quite a few projects since we moved there in 16. We've had quite a few projects where someone says, hey, I drove by like for three or four times. And I didn't know what you did. So I looked you up. We could really use you. And, and for me, you know, I'm not a braggadocious kind of guy, but I also understand that marketing is about putting yourself out there. Uh, so like when we do conferences of any sort, we're always handing out t-shirts with our logo. Uh, and I've had clients call us years later, like, hey, I had this problem. I didn't know who could solve it. And then I'm literally wearing your shirt at the computer. And I think, oh, well, they can fix it for me. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I, I, the sign for us when we built that building, one of the things that we worked into our lease was that we would have the rights to have the sign up there because I knew that if we were going to make a move and find a new home that was going to be permanent for us as we grow, um, I wanted to make sure that that our logo presence was right there on the roadside. So yeah. that location was very specific for us. We chose it for many reasons, but that was one of them. So you start when you started out. It sounds like you started out uh, not a typical web design company. You were pretty into the architecture, the development in the background. Is that kind of still where you are with Ethod or is, is that how you differentiate yourself? Well, the original goal was to be really back-end type coding. Okay. Um, but when you're early on, you'll take anything that's paying, right? So we took on all kinds of things that were design-based. And I had people in the industry I knew who were phenomenal designers. So I would always sub out the design part and then we would do everything after the, the, the design. And at, at the time, most of the work that was out there was that type of work. Um, it's a lot different now. I mean, most businesses in the last 10 years have transitioned online, which means all their ERP systems are online, all their internal systems are online. Yeah. Every college we work with, every together. hospital, that's exactly right. Everything has to talk because people don't want to call in to get their information. They want it online. And as that transition happened is when we saw our business start to flourish because we wanted to be in that niche to begin with. Um, but it took a little bit for that um, industry shift to really happen. So Ethode started what year, you said? 2010. So you're 20 years old or 10 years old. Yeah, that's right. Yep, that's a good point. We June just passed would have been our 10 year anniversary. We didn't even have a, I mean, COVID has had us all working from home. We didn't even celebrate well, it. Oh, happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. Happy <laughs> anniversary. So uh, you, you're, you, you have this web development company going on. You're, you're heavy into the development side of things, the technology. Have you done any big sites? I mean, what are, are you still into e-commerce? We still love e-commerce. It will always be a staple of what we do. 
Um, this year, we just released the site for LeBron James, so LeBronJames.com. You did LeBron James. We did. And, and how long would, I mean, just like, how Ooh. long does that take? Well, I, well, so we started with the I Promise School first. So uh, one of our clients is Akron University or University of Akron. I always get it reversed. And um, of course, LeBron is very heavily invested in the city of Akron and education. Did you and meet so, <laughs> no, that's that, that, of all the things we've done. That's the only thing that's that's disappointed me in this whole thing is I, I want to just shake his hand and say thank you. Yeah. He's a cool ki- cool guy who's done a lot for the city. Um, it'd be nice just to say, hey, I appreciate it. Yeah, maybe you still get that chance. I might. There's a lot of time, <laughs> but. Um, but, but so they said, hey, who do you guys work with and what platform do you use? And they said, oh, we'll talk to Etho. They're the biggest implementer in the country for this thing now. And we were like we, we, we the platform that we do a lot of work with, we're the largest implementer in North America for. And we started when they were in the infancy and we were in infancy and we grew together. And um, so they came to us and said, hey, we got this I promise school that we're going to be starting. Here's the gist. And we had just hired our fir- first full time in-house is, graphic designer. When? What what time frame was this? I want to say it would have been late 2017, 2018, early maybe. OK. And um, I think that's about the right range. Now, you mentioned you, you, you're you the largest uh, developer on this platform. Are you allowed to share the platform? Uh, yeah, it's called .CMS. It's a content management system. OK. It is heavily geared towards larger organizations, especially if you have a lot of data needs, integration needs. Um, you know, a lot of sites now uh, are on WordPress, which is great for an informational site where you've got 20, 30 pages. But if you're a hospital and you have 30 subsidiaries and 30 sites you're managing and they all have to talk to an internal ERP system and, you know, you are you are greatly uh, out of the range of where something like a WordPress is going to work for you. You have to have an enterprise content management system that is built for the developers to integrate it with other data systems. Is that systems. what the, the .CMS stands for? So content. they well, they started as a marketing company and realized it was way more money in the software. <laughs> so they, they built their own platform uh, and renamed the company from .marketing to .CMS. Um, and, and their, their clientele at that time was already medical and education and companies that needed something like that. So, um, they had a customer base that we were going after. They had a customer base already. And so they were looking for developers who would look at their product and say, we think this could be a player in the market. We want to adopt it as something we implement for our clients. And so that's how we got into some of those niches that we really wanted to get into early was because we made those relationships with the platforms that those companies were buying and we became experts in them. You know, again, you want to be you have to have a cursory knowledge of a couple different platforms, but you got to be masters in one or two of them. And .CMS by far for us is the platform that we spend the most amount of our time with and uh, developer resources in. So it's 2017. You get an opportunity. You've been working with University of Akron. They introduce you to, to I Promise School. Now you're starting development with them. <laughs> and we had three weeks. Oh, by the way, we had three weeks. <laughs> what, what was driving the what was driving that? Well, by the time that they selected us as the firm to do the work, uh, there was so little time between when they wanted to announce the I Promise School and the time we had that we worked around the clock for three weeks and we we hit a deadline for them. We got that site live. And it was primarily content and design. It wasn't, there was no coding and integration type work. Uh, but we had to set up the .CMS platform. We had to get the site ready. We had to get all the graphics done. Everything had to be approved. All the text had to be done. Was there a second phase like to follow? Oh, yeah, yeah. So you had to have that in part of your design. Absolutely, yeah. So there was, there was a lot that had to happen really quick. And then um, after the launch, we kind of took a breather. <sighs> okay, you know, for the next couple of years, what's your vision for the site? And let's get those on paper. And so, you know, we're, we're really more and more of a maintenance mode with the I Promise School as they continue to grow and do cool things. Uh, and then we focused on the LeBron James Foundation, which hadn't been updated in a decade. It was an old site built by um, the gentleman who does their marketing for them. He's full time with them. And um, his background was doing some basic web design. And, um, you know, as LeBron James fame and fortune and everything else expanded, his ability to spend his time doing any of that stuff, you know, vanished. And yeah. so uh, I was fortunate that, um, you know, he wanted to work with us. And those other two sites were just as much fun, obviously not under a time deadline. Uh, we got a, a lot of opportunity to perfect it and make sure that it's, um, 
uh, it meets the standards that we wanted to meet. And, uh, and in fact, I like all three sites, but I think the LeBron James Foundation is probably one of the most beautiful, beautiful sites we've ever done in 10 like years. Who, who would be the type of person you're working with on that? Like the LeBron Foundation, who's your go-to? Who's your contact? Uh, so you don't it, even give me a name, but I'm like functional role. Who is it? The, well, there's a marketing manager who spends a lot of his time in between uh, LeBron's different entities. So, uh, so it's one person that handles all of these entities. That's who you're working with. Yeah, he's he's wow. got a lot in his hands. He does a good job. He's local. Uh, he does a good job. Uh, he went to school with LeBron. Has been with him ever since. Um, and. Uh, it, it, and I'll say this too. Um, once we did the I Promise School site with them, and I got to spend a little bit of time with them and tour the school and and you know talk to him outside of business, um, it was really impressive to me because you envision a lot of these players just hiring yes men or people whom want to make money or they like being associated with LeBron. But his heart was so amazing towards the kids and what they were trying to do in the city and the mission. Um, for me, I feel like LeBron's probably the 1% of sports players uh, in any sport who's doing what he's doing. Um, but when you see the heart, you know, he's like 0.01%. Like people just think of LeBron because they see the games and the commercials. But when you like hear what his heart is to fix in society and with children and with education. And like, it's a real, it's a real focus for him. Um, you just don't hear about a lot, right? Because yeah. he's, he's famous. He's got a thousand <clears throat> things you hear about LeBron for, but not that. And uh, so for me, that was, that was one of the things that um, really felt like, okay, we're in the right place with these guys. Like we could do something more than just build a site and make some money. Like we can have impact as well. And so for us, it became one of those things where, you know, in any way possible, when we can be helpful with their mission, we try to be, you know, cause they're doing some cool things that we couldn't do without them. Well, and I, I would feel assume like, you would have to get pretty intimate with them. You got to get to know them. So you can yeah. bring that into the site. In absolutely, because, um, Humans are innately emotionally driven. We don't like to th think of ourselves that way, but we make decisions based on emotion. When you're trying to get donors to donate towards a cause like I Promise or to get involved with the foundation, you know, it's not about st citing statistics. It's not about just telling people how cool you are, what you do. It's about evoking that emotion that says, you know, I felt like crying because what these guys were doing was so impactful to the people that are around me that you feel like not being involved is a disjustice to yourself and to them. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with a properly ran marketing campaign and website. You can bring that emotion to the table so that you're drawn in and you feel like you have to get involved. So <clears throat> I'm trying to envision Etho doing this, okay? And you get a section done or you get a piece done and now you're going to share it with them. Was it like <laughs> nerves and you're nervous and, hey, are we on the right page here? And did you have some unveiling and how did all that kind of stuff work out? Well, the I Promise School and the foundation went great. Uh, I don't get nervous anymore. Ten years into this industry, uh, I expect it to go completely wrong, right? And, and if they love it, then great, it's a win. But design is one of those things that's very subjective. Everybody looks at design and art differently. So I never take offense to it. You can never be offended when you put something out there and someone hates it. And I don't get nervous, it's a part of the process. Um, the first two sites were great. I mean, blown away. In, in fact, the foundation, um, their advisory board at the foundation, a lot of them own other businesses in the area that you would probably know. Uh, and they were so impressed. They're like, we're using these guys when we do our redesign. And so I felt like those two sites were really smooth. The LeBronJames.com uh, site, the first revision was an absolute horrendous blowout. No one liked it. I mean, it was, even I didn't like it, but it's what we had, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I felt like there was definitely- okay, so How do they tell you they don't like it? Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, and who tells you that? This, this marketing person you're working with? Yeah, and, and there's, there's some people on advisory boards that have input as well. So kind of walk me through a little bit. How do they say, that isn't gonna work? Uh, well, they're actually really polite about it. I mean, you know, uh, Nick Lopez is who we work with a lot there. And, you know, Nick is very polite, but, 
he doesn't mix his words, right? If he doesn't like something, he can just tell you, this is not the direction we need to go, guys. Scrap all this, but let's talk about where we should be going. Otherwise, the next revision is going to be just as far offline. Um, and, and, and that doesn't happen often, but it does happen. Sure. Um, one of our clients is Carter Lumber and they were a client early on when it was just me and they had all this huge growth as I, as I got them online, but they outgrew what I could do for them. And, um, cause it was just me at the time and one intern. And so they actually came back to us a little about like a year and a half ago. They had went through several firms, were super unhappy, had no idea that we had grown from me to just shy of 50 people. And so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so they came back and um, uh, we're embarking on redesigning all their stuff. And same thing, iteration number one was just terrible. It just, most people probably wouldn't have thought poorly about it, but we knew where they wanted to go and what they wanted to do. And I just think, I didn't think it encompassed things really well. And so we scrapped revision number one and revision number two was out of the park, you know? So that's just a part of the process. Yeah. Nobody hits a home run every time they're at bat. Uh, the important part is that you have a process where everyone understands that up front. Ben. What are you seeing in the market specifically with COVID right now? Is it is it impacting the web design, the web development, the way people are approaching their website now? Are people trying to get a different message across? Is there different functionality that people are going for now? Is there any change going on as a result of? Yeah, it's it's changed how the world operates and dramatically for us as well. Uh, you know, 2020 started out really well for us. We had more projects signed than we've ever had. Uh, and then COVID hit, right? And you know, at least half of them, you know, went on hold immediately. Yep, yep. Uh, and we knew that was gonna happen. As soon as we saw the, the hint of what was gonna happen here, we, we, we kind of knew that was gonna happen. Uh, but we had enough work that it wasn't really a problem. Uh, in fact, we were hiring. So really it just, it slowed down our, <laughs> slowed down our hiring more than anything. Uh, and most of them have picked back up now that we're we're kind of over the hump. Um, but the so you have seen that it's it's it seems to be oh yeah on the upswing now. It, 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 for for now now if we have a second wave I fully expect to see some halting on on spending um, and in from a design and development perspective we're seeing a lot more companies coming in from our lead generation we're seeing companies come in who are benefiting from COVID right so you think of someone like Kojo. Uh, I mean, this is Christmas for them. I mean, Gojo couldn't make more money if they tried right now. Um, and so there are companies that definitely this has been beneficial for, and we're seeing a lot of new leads roll in from companies that are beneficiary of what's happening in the market. So we're seeing a little bit of shift in the type of customers who are contacting us, um, but they're still centered around e-commerce. They're still centered around needing people to tie systems together and the type of work that we do. So the type of work we're doing isn't any different. It's just different types of clients. You know, we, I don't think I have all but one client who's in, you know, chemistry type, you know, industrial backgrounds or actually in paint ingredients. And so, um, you know, to start seeing requests come in from companies that do, uh, whether it's, you know, we sell machines that people are using to fill bottles for sanitizer, or we actually sell sanitizer, we want to sell more online, and, and the list goes on, you know, sure. so we're getting different types of contacts right now than we've ever had. Is most of, uh, is most of your business companies that are reaching out to you because they kind of heard, heard about you, it was a referral? kind of how much is how much of that versus how much you guys are out drumming up business on your own what's that look like in your industry so we do um, a little bit of ppc uh, recently so the last maybe year and a half for 10 years most of our marketing has been doing conventions and conferences and, and we we strategically have done that on Which purpose those are those are all but dead right now well right? they're dead right now so the other thing with online, and, and we're in this world now, now that conferences are all dead and we're doing PPC, a lot of our leads that come in from search engines are people who have set an RFP out to 30 companies and they're just looking for the, the lowest bid. And we don't even bother with that anymore. Uh, you know, if you don't wanna get into a meeting and let us talk about requirements and get to know us <laughs> and shake a hand or do a digital, um, you know, chances are we're not gonna get along. You know, yeah. and I don't want to have clients where I don't get along. I don't want to have clients yeah. where I loathe being in a meeting with them. You've been in business long enough. You know what type of client you need and what That's type right. of client you work with. Well, and, and you do reach a point in which, you know, from now until the day I retire, 
there's always going to be struggle in business. No business is easy 24 seven, but I can at least control who I hire and I can control what clients we take in. Yeah. And so I can control how much misery is around us. Well, it's any. funny you mentioned that. <laughs> you mentioned earlier about when you're just starting out, you you take everything. Oh, yeah. Right? And I did that, too. I mean, yep. you, yeah, we can do that. Oh, yeah, we, we can do it. Because you need the revenue. Yep. But then you begin to realize as you mature as a, as a business owner, as a business person, and your company matures, not all business is good business. Yep. Some of it brings a lot of headaches if it's just the wrong client, the wrong industry, the wrong application, whatever. Not good expectations. Well, there's a smart man that I met uh, through the hosting world. He owned a hosting company. He does it now. He's out of that business now. But he was in it pretty early, and I knew of him. And I finally reached out to him and we had some breakfast and he said to me something I'll never forget. And I took his advice and it's been great. He said, you have to niche down to grow up. And he was absolutely right. I mean, we really had to find the, the things that we wanted to target and make ourselves undisputably the best in. So that if you were comparing us to other firms, Maybe other than price, there's no reason you're not going with us. They're not going to be nicer than us. They're not going to have better portfolios than us. They're not going to know the product better than we do. They're not going to be, uh, you know, with the product as long as we have. Yeah. It, it, it basically, it, unless you got an issue with price, there's no reason you're not going with us. Mm -hmm. And so that was that was great advice. You know, I just recently had, I had did a show with a uh, Microsoft partner, ah, and they're a CRM partner. And when they first started out for the first several years, they did all kinds of CRM. They did sales logic, they did Salesforce, they did Microsoft CRM, they did uh, a couple other ones. But he said it wasn't until he finally decided, I have to go with one horse here. Yep. And he chose Microsoft. And he said it was at that point that his business really took off. Yep. But it wasn't until he got to that, uh, how'd you say it? You, you got to niche, niche down, down to grow up, niche down to grow up. And that's pretty much what he said. Find out where you play. Yep. Well, I'll tell you, some of those platforms, there's more customers and potential customers out there than you could ever service. Yeah. You know, so you're not really hurting your business by getting rid of things on the peripheral. You're, you're really just getting rid of distractions. Uh, and we had to do that. So we had... Um, we had a SaaS company we started that was kind of like Shopify, but for group apparel ordering. We had other things that we were kind of dabbling in and we just kind of had to close it all down. Like there was just too many things and we had to focus and say, what are we going to do? And, and in fact, again, t talking with Vinny, Vinny Fisher, um, one of the things he told me, he other than niche down and grow up, is he said, you have to implement the quarterback model. I said, well, what is the quarterback model? He said, well, <laughs> you're about to split your business into two. So we had always been doing the data center space type work. So managing servers for clients up at AWS, Rackspace, physical data centers, you name it. And he said, the problem, Josh, is as you grow, you're only one person. Like you can't manage both businesses. And I had a phenomenal COO and business partner in Ethoed. And so I said, you know what, Jason, I think Vinny's right. I said, I think I need to spend most of my time, split Lightspeed into its own company, start to focus on the hardware side and hosting side, and let you kind of start to take over the responsibilities uh, of what I'm doing in Ethode. And in fact, one of, one of my developers who had ran his own firm before he came to work for me, um, so he knew the struggle of, of running his own firm. Um, I put him in business development. I took him out of coding and out of project management and into business development because he already had a history in selling projects and he knew how to do the work so he could do all facets. And he's done phenomenal. It was one of the best things I ever did was to pull myself out of that business and say, I'm too busy to do the job justice of doing the day to day. That's not an easy thing for a business owner to do. Well, when people who have come before you and are successful, give you advice, uh, it's it's important yeah. to weigh it. Yep. Not, and it's not always right. Sometimes advice is right for one person, not for another. But I felt like we had already tried route A for many years. Um, it was getting bigger. I, I was overloaded. I was working a lot of hours. And as the, the data center business was growing, there was very few people who knew how to do anything in the organization with it besides Did me. most of that grow out of uh, result from Ethode, from hosting sites and stuff? Is that where that grew? Initially, yeah. So initially, you, you know, you build it, it's got to go somewhere. People don't know where the best place is to host a site. Uh, they don't know how to run their own servers. If they're big enough, they need the well, own let me servers. Ask you something. 
when you first started out, you're developing sites. Did at some point you set back and you say, geez, while we're developing, why don't we just provide them this whole package where we host it? Well, that seems to make sense. Is that kind of how that started? Yeah, well, it's, it's even worse than that. So what happened is we had some big clients that we lost because there were firms that were handling front to back. They were handling the coding and the hosting. And I would get the response of, well, we just want to pay one company and we don't want to have, if something's wrong, we don't have to call two companies. And, and that only happened once or twice before I said, well, that's not happening again. Yeah. And so um, a buddy of mine who went to college with me, phenomenal, phenomenal software developer, but actually was trained as a system administrator through college. Um, I said, you know, I'm at a point where I've got to start doing all the hosting side. There's no way around it. I know how to do it, but I don't have time. And he goes, you ought to check out a company called Liquid Web. Well, it's called Liquid Web now. Then it was called Storm On Demand. They said, you can rent the servers there. Uh, you can manage them yourself, but they have good support. If you're in a hurry and you can't get to something, just put in a ticket. They'll take care of it for you. And so it was a way for me to basically have, at the time, my own IT staff yeah. working on the server so I didn't have to. And we didn't have to hire someone full time yet. Uh, we quickly outgrew uh, that model. So uh, they charged a huge premium on the servers to be that support team. Uh, when I could be buying those servers for a tenth that price somewhere else. And so once we got to the point where, you know, we were hosting hundreds and hundreds of clients, um, I, I went to my partner, Jason, and I said, this is silly. We need to just build our own data center. I, I don't even want to build in someone else's data center. I want to own a data center. And so that's a big undertaking. Yeah. <laughs> so for better or for worse, I'm a personality that the, the bigger the, uh, the obstacle, the more exciting it tends to be, right? So that personality that says, I don't want to go hiking. I want to go climb out on Everest, right? Like I, I tend to be that personality. And so to me, it was more of an excitement. It didn't make me nervous. And I certainly wasn't scared. It seemed like an exciting adventure. Yeah, there would be things that wouldn't go right. And some things didn't go right. Uh, but I knew that I knew that with enough perseverance, we would be just as good as anybody else. And so in our office, before we moved to Route 18 here, we had a little office in a basement. I mean, it looked like a lair. It was sketch. And I had, I had an electrician bring in a 200, uh, 240 volt line for us. And in what I can only describe as a closet that was transformed into a break room, we ripped off the table and we put it in a server rack. And I bought a bunch of used hardware on eBay so that we could start playing with virtualization platforms that were out on the market and get to know them. And so, um, you know, we, we, uh, we were lucky we didn't burn that uh, apartment complex down and you could, probably could have fried an this egg. This isn't an apartment. This isn't even in your home. Well, it's an apartment. It, it, it looks like um, it was at one time residential, but it was certainly commercial while we were in there. And the basement was, it looked like it was maybe used as a small studio for someone, uh, some sort of movie studio, uh, but it was cheap and we needed cheap. Uh, at the time, and we needed more space than we had at the time. Uh, and I needed a place that was in a specific location. And so uh, with those used servers and with probably the worst setup in the world, I went to my clients and I said, look, you're paying the same price for a development server that has no production value as you are your production servers. Let me virtualize your development servers only and I'll charge you 99 bucks a month. So the $300 you're, you're paying for that development server that you always gripe you have to pay for, I'll do it for 99 bucks a month. And they had no idea that it was in some ghetto closet with janky hardware I bought off of eBay. And they didn't care because we have backups of everything. They just trusted us. You know, we had a relationship with our clients since 2010, many of them. And that quickly grew to the point where like, okay, this cannot stay here like, <laughs> like yeah. this. And that's when we found this facility on Route 18. It was right next to voltage lines where we could pull in 12.4 thousand volts. It was on the fiber network, Medina County fiber network, which we were adamant we wanted to be a part You're of. You're right on the fiber. Absolutely. We, I mean, right on it. We're on their backbone. Yeah. Um, and we wanted to be in Medina. We're the only data center in Medina and we wanted that to still be the case. And so we built the data center more focused towards virtualization than we did just slapping 200 racks there. So a lot of data centers, they just give you power and cooling. So you have Ethode and Lightspeed now in the same building. That's right. Okay. Well, and, and it took us about 10 months to build that facility out. And we worked with 
Uh, we worked with uh, generator systems here on Route 18, actually helped us engineer some of the electrical infrastructure on it. Uh, and Jerry Fumi from SVN, so, you know, you see the signs everywhere, but he has a lot of commercial real estate holdings as well as his commercial his brokerage. a lot. Oh, yes. He's, he's great at marketing. Uh, but I, I learned... <laughs> We talked to a lot of build, uh, building owners and brokers. Jerry was different in that he wanted to be involved. Like once he heard what he was doing, like I'm not even sure in his mind, he thought he could make money on it, but he was interested in what we were doing. And so uh, there were times when like we reached impasses where we're like, well, we can't afford that. Like some of the stuff that we did and in infrastructure changes, there were, weren't things that we anticipated. Uh, so our lease is chock full of things that Jerry just paid for and put on a five-year lease for us. <laughs> you know, like he really stuck his neck out for us in a way where nobody would have. No brokerage would have done for us what he did. Uh, and it's been wildly successful. I mean, in hindsight, it was a right choice, but that was a lot of risk he took on. He didn't sure. know us. Yeah. Uh, and Which was pretty important for you at the time to have a landlord like that. Absolutely. And we've never missed a payment in, in three and a half years. And I will never, I will not pay myself if it means paying him on time. Uh, not that we have to worry about that now, but that, that's how much yeah. I care about him. And we have another facility on the other side of the county. It's in Valley City, about a 30,000 square foot facility. Uh, and we're actually working on a third right now that's going to be in Akron. Uh, we looked at a lot of the locations for now, a year. Now, what's the benefit of having multiple facilities still within somewhat of a geographic area? Uh, in, in our particular case, um, we, we do now have a presence in Atlanta, uh, and we're working on another location in Texas, but they're very small installations. They're really just for our cloud infrastructure. Um, in the local area, we do a lot of high-density hosting that no one else does. So I'll give you a great example. Uh, we fell into this. I'm not a genius. I didn't think of this overnight. It kind of came to us by accident. Uh, but we have clients that are doing video rendering for Hollywood, right? Um, and video rendering is not a typical server colocation business. I mean, you're talking about servers that are this big, this tall, full of GPUs. GPUs you would use in your computer for like high intense gaming. And they're using way more electricity than you could ever fit into a single rack. Uh, and they don't care if you have generator or UPS backup. They just want cheap electricity and want you to keep their stuff cool so it doesn't die. And there's no data centers geared towards that. There just, there just aren't. And so we started a data center focused on that side of the clientele in Valley City. And our build in Akron will actually be a combination of both our enterprise cloud so, and that type of business. So these are a little bit of different hosting that you're doing. There. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, and we help uh, on the consulting side too. So some of those clients, um, you know, if they they want advice of, well, we're having issue with X, Y, Z, here's what we're running into. We get involved and say, oh, well, you're having issues because, you know, X, Y, and Z is overheating. You know, if you do this instead, you can keep your temps at a normal level and not have these interruptions throughout the day. Or, you know, uh, a lot of them have studios in um, uh, Europe that are trying to send video over here for rending. And, you know, you can't just send stuff overseas all the time. You know, you actually have to have good, good internet BGP routes to get the clients. You have to understand what networks exist in the area, what fiber exists in the area. And you have to build a plan so that they can send you 20 terabytes of data in a reasonable timeline yeah. and, and still meet their deadlines. And so there's a lot of engineering that goes into it that has been kind of fun. But those are types of clients that, um, you know, they're just not a good fit for a traditional data center. So a lot of our clients, we have always on the data center side, we've tried to focus on people that no one wants, basically. Well, it's interesting because you're talking about hosting. I mean, kind of what you're describing is we think of hosting, the general person thinks of hosting as people just got data they need to put out. Well, you're talking about even in the hosting environment, it could be very niched. That's right. Very niche. And I don't think, you know, most people think about that. They're just thinking about any data out there. That's exactly right. But you're saying no. And that's what I'm hearing from you. I got this data center that kind of focuses on this type of hosting. That's right. Right. Well, and, and the other niche we have is we do a lot of virtual desktop. So uh, th your office here is a great example. Just like us, you're working from home. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily know the type of clients you have here, but some of our clients are, are CPAs and lawyers and people who have data that if you lose your laptop, you're talking about hundreds, if not millions of dollars worth of data that can now be subject of lawsuits and all kinds of other things. 
So this service we tailored specifically around clientele that either A, were already moving around a lot, or they had a lot of sensitive data that they didn't want to keep at their office. And so because we're on the Medina County Fiber Network and we can get direct fiber to nearly anybody in the county, and now Akron, now that we work with Fairlong Gig, um, it opens up a lot of these clients. They have all their infrastructure virtualized into our data center where your computer technically lives in our cloud. Your laptop in front of you is just a terminal. So it's, it's a dummy box now. Nothing actually lives on it. If that laptop you have dies, you don't worry. You go pick up another cheap laptop from Best Buy. Chromebook. You can pick up a Chromebook. That's exactly it. And then you connect back up all your stuff's in the cloud. And, and the nice thing is you now have control. Uh, I had one client. So that you're was, providing office all the normal stuff as well as yep. access to their applications that they may be using as well. Yep, and, and we support it. So support from day one has always been a strong point of our business uh, because you could always hire a nerd to implement something technical for you, but who's gonna stand by you when something's not right? Uh, something's not right at midnight and you have a deadline, you wanna call someone and you wanna know that they're gonna fix the thing is that's broken so you can meet your deadline. Yeah. So that support, that handholding is a big part of our business. It's something we do well. And the virtual desktop clients are a great example because many of them have been using outside IT firms or they had an IT guy that sat around and twiddled his thumbs most days, but they kept them because if something breaks, someone's gotta fix it. So now that it lives in our infrastructure, our team can actually manage it remotely and you have 24 seven support if something goes down. How long has, has virtual desktop been around that it's kind of mainstream? Well, it, it had a heyday long before now. Uh, there were big companies that implemented it and those companies had a huge bottleneck in that the internet was young and the ability to move data was very impaired. And so you saw it die out. Virtual desktop had been around for a long time. It just wasn't efficient. Yeah. Well, now that there's fiber everywhere, now it's different. See, now you actually get to see people implementing it and it's actually a much better situation than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's a workable situation. And the, and the best part is, um, you know, here in Medina, we made a bet 10 years ago when they built this fiber network, we said, look, of all the kinds we're looking at, they look like they really care about IT. They look like this is something they want to attract here. This could be to our benefit. So we built here specifically because of what the Port Authority did with the fiber network. And it could have flopped. We didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. We took a bet. And it's done amazingly well. And that's been to our benefit, right? Because we were early on in the process and the only data center. And so there was a lot of new clientele that came out of that. You work with David Corrado? Every day I'm on the phone with him. There is not a day. He's a good guy. He is a good guy. And, and again, back, back to support, one of the things, I mean, it could be 3 a.m. He's involved. Absolutely. And, and he's technical as well. Yes. He knows the technical side, but he's got a personality. He can work with you. Yep. Yeah. He He's always got a smile. He's always got advice he wants to give you. He's always got help. Uh, and he's a great connector. If you need something that he can't provide, he knows someone who does. Yeah. So they, they did a great job selecting him and they, they spared no expense on the network here. The network here was built beautifully. Um, what we have now and the way David has it set up, we have a network here that's unparalleled amongst almost any municipality that's built their own network. It's amazing. People have no idea how amazing the network here is uh, until they're on it. And um, and we also connect up to Fairlong Gig now. Fairlong Gig has come a long way since they built, what, two years ago? And we work heavily with Dustin there. Um, and, and again, a lot of it is to support that VDI, the virtual desktop infrastructure, and knowing that we have gear throughout the two counties that directly connects us to those clients, for them, it's just as fast as if that gear is in your closet. Yeah. They don't even notice yeah. it. And, and then they, they kind of like, once it's all done, this, like, this weight is off their shoulders. They're not worrying about equipment anymore or is power down at my office. Now we can't get to anything. Was there a lightning bolt that surge, uh, you know, surge then fried something? And did we have backups of it? All these things that for years we worried about that we didn't think could ever be lifted off our shoulders. Once they're gone, like, why didn't I do this sooner? Yeah. This is so much, so much easier. And yeah. you're not, you don't let IT control your company anymore. How, it enables it. How has COVID impacted light speed? What were some of the big things you saw? 
Well, we we knew immediately there would be a big shift in what was going to happen. So we, we knew immediately two things would happen. People who were not ready to work remote needed to become ready to work remote. We also knew we had clients who wouldn't be making money for a while. <laughs> so we we had a really weird transition for two months and where we knew receivables was going to just drop and it did. Yep. Uh, but we had so much new business coming in that it didn't matter. So um, for the last three, four months, I've been so busy, I can hardly keep up. You know, every week I've got five new installs, whether it be for fiber or for virtual infrastructure or for firewalls in the data center. Uh, you know, we've never been this Just busy. Just a lot of this because of the, the work from home? Absolutely. No, one's pre- no one was really prepared for it. We had been telling people for a long time that you can allow your employees to work from home and still remain accountable. Uh, we had been we had been a remote workforce with some in the office for so long that for us it was second nature. But for some other people who grew up in a uh, in a business atmosphere where you know there's always the fear of well how do you keep employees honest? Well, I've been telling those people for years. People want to do a good day's work. The 80-20 rule: twenty percent of people are are not going to do good work whether they're in the office or not, whether they're at home or in their office. They're lazy. But the 80% of the people on the other end of the spectrum, they want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel like they accomplished something. They want the attaboy. Uh, they want to feel like they're they're even doing a good enough job to move up in the ladder, right? Some people are really wanting to move up in the ladder. And those 80% of people, they work just fine from home. You know, yep. now they might get bored. I'm that person. I hate being at home. I get bored. Um, but they do good work still from home. And everyone who doubted that model for so long has been forced into that model. And now they're like, this is nothing. This is so easy. Well, we were that. We had no intent of sending people home. Yeah. We were not going to be a work from home company. <laughs> and when the mandate came down, and now it's, I mean, it's its good. I mean, yeah. it, there's, there's things that aren't quite as good. There's challenges still. There's challenges. And, and a lot of those challenges are how do you create community? Okay, and collaboration. And and so, you know, you learn that, you you know, there's a lot of, we use Teams, Microsoft Teams. And so you start leveraging some tools and stuff that are out there and then some other things that you're trying to do. But overall, fortunately, it's very favorable. Yep. Very favorable. Well, and, and in this day and age, we've all heard the saying, people are less and less looking for the highest salary They're looking for flexibility and culture. And the reason why the work from home movement and flexibility uh, has taken off is because people have changed their sight from just because I'm paid well doesn't mean I'm going to be happy. And part of that perk that companies can give them is the ability to work remote, not just, hey, you're actually at your office, at your house, but your infrastructure is remote. You could be at the air, you know, the airport and you can log into your virtual desktop infrastructure. And so, you know, what we do kind of enables that type of company. What are you hearing from from uh, business owners and companies as far as are they intending to go back? Everyone I've talked to now, just because I talked to them doesn't mean that other companies differ. But the ones I've talked to have all said we've seen a new way of operating and we like it. Um, most of them want to see partial uh, yeah. you know, partial staffing back at the office. And actually for the same reasons you said, uh, I'm at my office alone almost every day and it stinks not having people there, but it's not worth endangering someone's life just so yeah. we get the com- office camaraderie back. Um, but we will, once it's safe, have some people back. Um, and we'll always have some people working remote, but now other companies are going to be doing that too. Yeah. And all of them have said the same thing. We think we've we've been forced into learning something we didn't want to learn, but now we're grateful for it. We'd like to see the market go back to normal and have yeah. our customers come back. But from an employee standpoint, we're very happy with this setup. Uh, and one of them, I actually ran into one of them on Monday. I stopped him at Subway, actually. Subway is like the, the greeting place because that's the only place to eat once you leave Medina. Uh, so like, it's like a family reunion every time I walk in there, there's always someone in there I know. And he goes, I was really worried about having everyone work from home. And he goes, I probably shouldn't have, I've had a lot of employees who have been here for a while and and they're great employees. He goes, but it was just a shift in how we operate. And he goes, now that they're at home, I find that they actually work more because, you know, if something happens at 7 PM at night, 
you know, they've already got their stuff with them. Like they just they, they just take care of it because they don't want to think about it while they're sleeping. Yeah. Like they don't want to bother them while they're trying to relax. And so they just knock stuff out, even if it's after hours. Whereas when you're in the office, a lot of people, their computer's in the office. They can't actually work from home. Yeah. And so when they leave the office, they're done. <clears throat> That's it. You know, I've been hearing from a lot of people and it's very similar. What they're saying is I get so much more done at home but I got to remind myself to get up and take a break. Yep. You know, I had one guy said, I have a piece of software now on my, on my computer that all of a sudden flashes me across the desktop that says, Hey, you need to get up. Other people have said, I go down at eight in the morning and at, before I know it, it's noon and I haven't even oh. got up, you know, so I'm hearing a lot of, a lot of that. Well, and, and we're in a position where, um, for us, this has been good. You know, COVID has been great for us. Uh, and I, I really, I say that so, so sparingly because I do know I have friends of mine who have already lost their business because of COVID. So I, I never want to say in, in a, a braggadocious way. Um, but for us, it's been great because yeah. the things we've been telling people for so it's long been good for the whole IT ind industry. And, and everyone I know in IT has said the same thing. Okay. We're so busy, we can hardly keep up. And, and I, I really, for me... I'm a punctual person. I'm early everywhere I go. I like to hit my deadlines as part of my personality. Um, I've had times in the last three months where like I've missed appointments. I've, I've had installs a day late uh, and, and it drives me up the wall. But I also understand that we're, we're just so busy. Like we're, we're, people are going to have to have some leeway because everyone in IT I talk to we're working 80 hours a week. Yep. You know, it's just insane. And the fiber optic networks, not Medina, but the big, the big guys who service internet throughout the world. So the Cogents, Level 3, CenturyLink. Uh, I have friends that work for those companies as well. And they cannot hook up customers fast enough. Sure. The wait list is humongous with some of these. And usually IT isn't something you want to force. No, you don't want to rush it. You don't want to rush you it. You don't want to rush it. And yeah, that's the one thing I, I've asked people for the last three months, have some grace. Anyone in IT, have grace, because we're all we're burning the candle at both ends right now. All yep. of us are. Yep. <laughs> well, hey, you uh, you shared a lot of stuff, a lot of interesting stuff. You have uh, kind of two very uh, different businesses, but yet at the same time, there's an intersection there. And it's interesting how you brought Lightspeed and Ethode together. Very interesting. You don't often see those those types of uh, businesses and, and industries uh, intersect under the same umbrella, and and you've done that. So I, I appreciate you taking the time and coming in and sharing all of that. If somebody wanted to reach out to you to Ethode or to Lightspeed, how do they find you? Well, both companies we have a hello email address: hello at ethode.com and hello at lightspeedhosting.com. Uh, we do that because again, it it sounds friendlier than info at or sales at. Sure. Um, so everything top to bottom from us is contact us. We're nice people. We love to talk. You know, even if you just want to ask us questions, call us up. Uh, I've had many people over the years call us up and just pick our brain and never give us a dime. And that's fine, you yeah. know, because you've you've left someone with a good impression and they'll sure. tell someone about you. So uh, send us an email. You can call us. Uh, or, or, uh, even better, we have Slack and discord channels linked on our sites. So you can, you know, if you're a, rather a typer than a talker, you can hit us in real time up online and, uh, somebody uh, will reach out. to Someone them. will reach out. We, we, we absolutely try and be the company that gives you as many ways possible to contact us. We don't force you into ticket <laughs> systems or long line queues. Um, you know, we want to be as accessible as possible and as quick as possible. Very good. Well, hey, thank you for taking the time. Thank uh, you. I, I found this very interesting. And, and my background is similar into yours from years ago. And so it was interesting to hear a lot of that. So I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. Thank you. I, I appreciate the time and uh, uh, look forward to seeing the, uh, yeah. the end result. Very good. <laughs> hey, thanks for uh, listening in. I thought this was pretty interesting. We covered a lot of ground today. We went from the, the marketing side, the design side, all the way over to the tech side and cloud services and hosting services and managed services. And so I appreciate you listening in. If you like shows like this, hit subscribe. We'd love for you to follow us. If you have ideas for shows that you're interested in, 
reach out to me, dharsh at danharsh.com. I would love to hear from you. We'll get a show that you're specifically listening to. We'll get it on the docket. So, hey, thanks for tuning in today.